Hello, Greg, just sent you an email. Uh, Ian here. Hi, how are you doing? Fine. Um, sent you an email. I was a bit worried that you are not prepared, but uh, at least I'm happy I've seen you. Um, I'll be moderating the session, so I'll do a, a brief a brief intro and then hand over to you uh, okay. to do your presentation. I don't know how long it will be, but I think after that we should have a, a bit of a Q&A. Uh, this is Professor Chiguli logging on. She's, she's the PI for the HAPPY project. Uh, I don't know if she can just uh, flash her face so that you can see her. But I think people will be joining from around uh, four o'clock, about two, three minutes from now. Okay. About five past four our time. Uh, somebody was on earlier, but I see they've logged off. So um, we may begin at about five past, five past uh, four, I think past eight your time. Eight, yes. Yes, eight. Uh, the, the last two sessions we've had people about a hundred, uh, one was 60, so I, I don't have any control over the numbers and it's a diverse community. So just be aware, you have questions from everywhere. Great, I love it. Great. All right, so let, let's, um, let's wait for the audience to log on. I see Chris has come, Chris, you're welcome. We'll wait until about um, five past four, then we, we start. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you.
Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody to today's session. Um, in the interest of time, I propose that we, we start, even though we are only 12, but I know for this session, over the next uh, four or five minutes, uh, we get a past experience, we get very many people logging in. So I'm Dr. Mnavi Ian, I hope you can see me. Uh, I'm moderator for this session. Uh, we have our, our presenter, um, Dr. Professor Greg Ponton. Um, he's a psychiatrist and uh, the director of, um, let me get it straight. He's a uh, director of the Parkinson Disease Neuropsychiatry Clinic. Professor in the Department of Neuro or Psychiatry and Neurology at John Hopkins University in Medicine, Baltimore. Um, he's published a lot of work on um, Parkinsonism. So actually here with the best and he's been working from 2001, I think that's when I saw your first paper, uh, Parkinson as, a, as a, something to do with seizures, multiple seizures, an interesting paper. I'd really like to know how, 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 why are you aware when you publish that you're a student or not, but you tell us. And um, he's talking about Parkinson's disease, which was first described in 1817 by James Parkinson. So we're talking about a 200 year old disease. And um, the topic of the presentation is Parkinson's disease more than just a movement disorder. And I think we'll have a, a plate full because I look at your work, you've covered everything from basic science, Lewy bodies, upper E, uh, and then you went on to do the behavioral side of it, suicide, uh, something on um, hoarding behaviors, uh, depression, I've seen something on anxiety. So I had a, a, quite a bit of uh, uh, interest reviewing your literature on, on this topic, which you've been doing since 2001. And there are very many papers. Um, you currently have uh, 1,938 citations, Google Scholar, and I also saw you have a K23, which I think is winding up now. And uh, I must congratulate you. I think you have a new R01 as well on visual hallucinations and Parkinsonism. So it, 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 it's quite a portfolio. And I think we are also in the best of hands uh, listening to you moving forward. So I think even though we have only 14 people so far, I, I suggest we begin. A, a few rules um, for the audience, please, um, please uh, just put your name and, and where you're from, your affiliation in the chat for record purposes. Um, that will help us. And, and I think um, let's all have uh, fairly descriptive names. Uh, there was somebody who was labeled as V. It's a bit difficult to call you if you just called V. I hope that's been fixed. Um, so with that uh, brief intro and a bit of the rules, uh, let's all mute our mics. So that is only one person speaking and to also reduce on the feedback. Um, I'd like to hand over to Greg to take us through what he has for us. Then after he's presented, we shall have a few, a bit of a Q&A, and hopefully we shouldn't go past an hour at the very most. If, if we do, I'll ask for permission to go much longer. Over to you, Greg. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you for the introduction, and thank you for having me today. Uh, I'll share my screen uh, so you can see these slides I have and get started. So, you know, as the title suggests, uh, what we've traditionally thought of Parkinson's disease is probably just a small portion of what the disease actually brings to someone suffering from it. Uh, it's considered a movement disorder, but today what I'm going to do is argue that it's much more than a movement disorder in terms of the, the total burden that it brings to uh, the patient and uh, the family. And so I don't have any relevant financial relationships with commercial interests uh, uh, regarding the content of this talk today. I will talk about maybe some unlabeled or unapproved use of medications. And I have done some consulting, but like I said, it won't necessarily uh, you know, pertain to the content of this talk today. So uh, hopefully uh, you'll know that this is sort of the evidence-based uh, information about the disease. So I really want to start out with an overview of Parkinson's disease. Uh, and, and I'm going to start with the historically 
uh, representative uh, description of Parkinson's, you know, the one that James Parkinson first put forward, and frankly, the one that we followed for most of the 200 year course, uh, and how that's changed over the last few decades, as we've recognized more of the non motor or, or neuropsychiatric symptoms. And so what's really interesting in this age of technology about diseases like Parkinson's disease is this diagnosis is still made based on clinical symptoms and history. You don't need any fancy tests or scans or blood work to diagnose someone with idiopathic Parkinson's disease. And in fact, uh, most of the time, and this is really unsatisfying for many patients, you'll walk into your neurologist's office and they'll do a few tests with your upper and lower body and you'll walk out with this life-changing diagnosis. And so this criteria has been revised over the years with the most recent revision being in a, around 2015. And so the single symptom that must be present in everyone who has idiopathic Parkinson's is a slowing of physical movement or what we call bradykinesia. And it's measured simply by having someone, for instance, tap their fingers or open and close their hand uh, for the upper body. And in the lower body, we might have them stomp their foot or tap their toe. And we're looking at the size or amplitude of the movement along with the uh, speed and coordination of the movement. And if there's a reduction in either the size or the speed of the movement, that's considered bradykinesia, okay? Most of the time, these symptoms will be will start on one side, and that sort of asymmetry will persist throughout the disease so that even when the symptoms become bilateral, there'll still be a persistent asymmetry with it being worse on one side, and that's pretty typical of idiopathic Parkinson's. Now, you've got this bradykinesia, the slowing of physical movement, and you have to have at least one other clinical symptom. Okay, for the diagnosis. And for many people, that's the classic sort of pill rolling tremor at rest when they're not making an intentional movement. Okay. Uh, for others, it may be muscular rigidity. Okay. And that's sort of uh, resistance to passive movement is the way we test that. Now, uh, some people will have all three of these, but you have to have at least two. Okay. With bradykinesia being the central one. Now, uh, later on in the course of the disease, a robust response to carbidopa, levodopa, or other dopaminergic agents is supportive of the diagnosis. Uh, the absence of a gaze paresis. So there's things that support this. But again, I want you to realize that a lot of these supportive things are also clinical. So, you know, we haven't scanned anybody's head or done anything else, and you have this diagnosis. Now, what, what's chiefly responsible? for you know, this, uh, these symptoms is a process that's associated with the accumulation of abnormally folded protein. And in this case, the chief protein is alpha-synuclein. And alpha-synuclein is misfolding with itself and other proteins like ubiquitin to form what we now call Lewy bodies inside the cell. And that along with a cascade of other signals triggers cell death. Okay. And when you get 60 to 80% of cell death in particular areas like the substantia nigra pars compacta, which is shown there on the right side of the slide, you get dopamine loss in the striatum. And that is what we think is behind the movement symptoms that you see clinically. Okay. And so in that top portion of the slide, you can see the normal substantia nigra, that's a dark band. Now, as those dopaminergic cells die, neuromelanin leaks out of those cells and the cells become pale on staining. And the Parkinson's condition you can see there in the bottom side, which is at a minimum, a loss of 60 to 80% of the dopamine containing cells. Okay. Now, the, the disease is staged and the severity is ranked based on these two scales in most places, okay? The staging is by the Honin-Yar stage, okay? Which is a five uh, stage model. Um, and the unified Parkinson's disease rating scale is how we uh, rank the severity of the motor symptoms. And that's a five point scale from zero being normal to four, 
Okay, and so I've put uh, an example here. Uh, at stage one, the symptoms are only on one side. As soon as you have any symptoms on both sides, so maybe you have a tremor on the right side and the bradykinesia a little bit on, on both, you've got stage two. As soon as you have impairment of balance or what we call postural reflexes, you've entered stage three. At stage four, now you're disabled to the point where you need an assistive device to walk or stand. And by stage five, you're either bed or wheelchair bound, okay? Now I want you to appreciate that the stage of disease is determined solely by the motor symptoms, okay? This is today in this day and age. And then the symptoms, and I've just put one example here for rigidity, the normal condition or unaffected or treated until symptom remission is zero. And then you can see that as you go one, two, three, four, the rigidity becomes more severe, okay? But again, this is all focused on the motor presentation of the disease, okay? So um, how do we treat this disease? Well, again, for the most part, and now this has changed in the last few decades, uh, which is a good thing. Uh, the, the aspirational treatment, the goal eventually, we're not there yet, is to prevent or delay the disease progression, right? D disease modifying therapies. We're not there yet, but we're very close, okay? So what do we have that we currently treat people with? We have sympt symptomatic treatment. So treatments that reduce the bradykinesia, diminish tremor, and help ease the rigidity that the, the patient's uh, enduring. And so these are things like uh, carbidopa levodopa, with lev levodopa being a dopamine precursor molecule and carbidopa being a molecule that prevents the peripheral decarboxylation. We give these orally. When they kick in and take effect, the symptoms are reduced, but when they wear off, the symptoms return. So we try to give people frequent enough dosing to where they never experience that wearing off. Sometimes it's great. Other times they get a, a little bit of a peak and trough effect that we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, sometimes to diminish that risk of wearing off, we'll use adjunctive therapies, things that extend the length of action of these dopamine molecules. Okay, there's a number of ways to do that from a, just an extended release molecule to uh, another molecule that uh, inhibits COMT, uh, used to be used quite a bit. Uh, four, we want to prevent or delay motor complications. So uh, if you've ever seen someone with Parkinson's disease, it's a hypokinetic or slow movement disorder, but every now and again, you'll see someone with this disease having a very rapid, fast, sometimes writhing or sinuous motion. Those are mostly what we call dyskinesia. That's a motor complication of therapy. Some of the most important studies of the determinants of dyskinesia were done there in West Africa by C uh, Celia et al. When they showed that the disease duration rather than exposure to dopamine might be the more important factor in the development of motor complications. Um, other motor complications are on-off fluctuations with the medication and freezing of gait. We'll talk a little bit about those as we go on as well. Uh, but that's another aspect of therapy in general. And, uh, and then therapies to treat those motor complications. So we have therapies that directly target things like dyskinesia or try to prevent people from having on-off fluctuations or rescue them when they're in a freezing episode or an off state. Okay. And so this is sort of the palette of options to treat the disease. And I, again, I want you to appreciate that the central thrust of therapy in Parkinson's, the staging, the diagnosis is all about the movement symptoms, right? So if, if you're a student in learning medicine, you would assume that this movement disorder only affects movement or predominantly affects movement. And if you do that, you're being a good doctor, a good clinician, and treating the patient the best you can. So uh, again, I think even now with the greater recognition, you could argue that the definitions, the legacy of how this disease has been considered has still revolved around one cluster of symptoms. And so there's good evidence. Uh, in fact, most of the evidence has been to date about the, uh, the motor symptom treatment. So dopamine agonists, are efficacious. The levodopa preparations are probably the gold standard in most places, whether they're the long-acting or the immediate-acting. Uh, monoamine oxidase inhibitors, uh, 
uh, B selective type like rosagiline and selegiline are also good augmenting. They're usually not used as monotherapy. And then in some cases, when the tremor is very bad and early disease, you might use anticholinergics to block the tremor. But I have to tell you that you're risking cognitive impairment when you do so. Amantadine is an anti-dyskinetic molecule that also helps with dyskinesia. And so uh, again, there's various levels of evidence, but all focused on the motor symptoms. And so when you look back on the original essay on the shaking palsy written by Dr. James Parkinson about just over 200 years ago now, he wrote, the senses and intellects were uninjured. And again, really only focused on the, the motor symptoms. And it wasn't until the end of the 19th century that people began to recognize that there were psychiatric problems like depression and anxiety. There were changes in cognition up to and including dementia. But even when this was recognized, people thought it was accessory to the disease and more may be attributable to the fact that most of the people with Parkinson's were elderly. And so maybe they had a senile dementia comorbid with the Parkinson's rather than people seeing this as, as associated with the disease. And that's what I wanna spend the rest of today talking with you about is that uh, this really is more than a movement disorder. And I like to think of it as a complex neuropsychiatric condition. And I'm just gonna run through some of the evidence for that, both in terms of the pathology and the clinical presentation of the disease. I've, I've been doing this uh, for about 20 years. Uh, you know, uh, in, during training is when I started publishing on this and seeing patients. Uh, and then I've continued to do that up until the present time. Uh, now with my clinic being almost exclusively focused on individuals with Parkinson's or related diseases. And so, what do we mean by a non-motor symptom? So, you know, we're going to leave the bradykinesia and things I just introduced behind and now really focus on the other aspects of the disease. So on the neuropsychiatric spectrum, we see everything from apathy, anxiety, depression, psychosis, impulse control disorders, really a, a wide palette of neuropsychiatric presentations that we think in many cases are directly associated with the same pathological process that causes the motor symptoms of Parkinson's. And I'm gonna show you uh, some reasons why we think this is true, okay? Cognitive impairment, and this has largely been unappreciated as associated with Parkinson's, but at the time of diagnosis with motor symptoms, 20 to maybe high estimate of 40% have a mild cognitive change that we think is associated to the pathological process of Parkinson's. And then here's the real, um, I, I think, tragedy here is that there's only a few longitudinal studies that have followed people with Parkinson's disease. And each one of those has found that if you live long enough with Parkinson's disease, about 80% of people will develop a dementia over the course of the illness, okay? So 80% within 20 years, 50% of people within 50, uh, I mean, 50% of the people within 10 years of motor symptom onset will have a dementia all the way up to 80 if you follow you know, up to 20 years. So not everyone, but a fair portion. Now, let me tell you something else. Up to a third of people with Parkinson's won't have that rest tremor. So I'm telling you that some of these non-motor symptoms are actually more prevalent in people with idiopathic Parkinson's disease than some of the motor symptoms we use to define the disease. The majority of people will lose their sense of smell, maybe up to 90%. Dysautonomia. So this is autonomia, you know, dysautonomia in the cardiovascular system with sympathetic cardiovascular denervation, okay? We see people who have orthostatic hypotension and mid and late disease. We see early gastric uh, dysautonomia in the form of constipation and later in the form of gastroparesis and dysphagia and swallowing difficulties. And so a very pervasive uh, loss of function in the, dis, uh, the autonomic nervous system, and then sleep disturbances with the chief uh, most common ones being insomnia, REM sleep behavior disorder, and vivid dreaming, okay? And those are the ones that are just best recognized. And so again, you know, you can see already that this is much more than a movement disorder. And let me show you a diagram that looks a little busy, but this is the BRAC, Hiko BRAC, he's a pathologist. This is his staging model for Parkinson's disease. The same gentleman uh, has also staged Alzheimer's disease. And 
he sort of um, envisioned, and there's good evidence for it, doesn't necessarily happen in every case of idiopathic Parkinson's, but he's envisioned this pathological progression of the disease from maybe the gut, right, where we first find Lewy bodies in the bowel, up through the vagus nerve into the brainstem, where at stage one, we first see Lewy bodies in the dorsal motor nucleus of the 10th cranial nerve, okay, the vagus nerve and the solitary complex and the nucleus ambiguous, okay? We find Lewy bodies there first. That's stage one. What symptoms of Parkinson's do you have then? Well, that's still being worked out. We do think there's a prodromal or premotor presentation of Parkinson's, but I can tell you that it's not movement symptoms because if you take just a peek a little higher up this slide, you'll see that the substantia nigra isn't involved in this pathological process until stage three. So you have the pathological hallmarks, alpha synuclein and Lewy bodies, lower in the brainstem, but you don't have the clinical presentation of motor symptoms yet, but you have probably what would be considered Parkinson's disease in the lower brainstem. Then it enters stage two, and then you start to get involvement of the locus ceruleus and the raphae, uh, the raphae um, nuclei. And these are really important at, for me as a psychiatrist because they're the chief producers of serotonin and norepinephrine. And these are molecules that we think are important for mood regulation, mood and behavior modulation, right? And when these are affected, we think that probably in the prodromal phase, you start to see mood and anxiety disorders, dysregulation of sleep and behavior. And then in stage three, and frankly, not until you're in stage three for a few years and you suffer a loss of 60 to 80% of those dopamine cells in the substantia nigra pars compacta, only then do we start to see the clinical symptoms, the bradykinesia, the tremor, the rigidity, and that's when it's diagnosed. So it's very possible that in many cases, the disease has been active for 10 or more years before it's actually diagnosed. Okay. From there, it starts moving toward the cortex and we start seeing things like more cognitive impairment, hallucinations and psychosis, delusions. Okay. And it goes upward from there towards stage six. But the reason I'm telling you all this is this is probably the mechanistic basis for a lot of what I'm going to talk about, not just the motor symptoms there in the midbrain in the stage three, but all of these psychiatric symptoms that are often associated with Parkinson's at a higher prevalence than we find in people who don't suffer from Parkinson's, all traceable back to the disorders work in the brains and brain stem. Okay. Now, uh, another way to look at this, and this is, um, I think, increasingly the way you're going to see not just Parkinson's, but other uh, neurodegenerative diseases considered, right, is using a slightly different uh, sort of schematic. So this might be the new landscape of Parkinson's disease. And I think you're going to hear about this with Alzheimer's as well. What we've traditionally recognized as the onset of disease, that middle circle there, symptomatic Parkinson's, is just stage three, right? That's just when stage three starts. So everything to the left there is prodromal or what some people call pre-motor Parkinson's disease. And it does have a recognizable clinical syndrome if you know what you're looking for in some individuals. And increasingly, we're finding biomarkers that tell us that people are in this stage. And then to the right of that, and this has also been underappreciated because it's been thought to be unrelated or a comorbid condition, is a, a condition that starts to involve the cortex and higher parts of the brain, a Parkinson's disease dementia syndrome, okay? Which is, like I said, almost inevitable in 80% of people with Parkinson's disease, okay? Not just something that a, an unfortunate few develop. And so, Again, just to look at this one more way, prodromal or premotor Parkinson's, are the ones I'm going to talk about today are things like anxiety and depression. I'm going to show you some evidence that hopefully persuades you that this is associated with Parkinson's in some cases, uh, loss of sense of smell, cardiac sympathetic denervation, and probably most important and most sensitive and specific, REM sleep behavior disorder. Okay. Uh, the symptomatic phase is easily recognizable. It's the motor symptoms and then the progression of those motor symptoms and then the response of those motor symptoms to the dopamine medications. And then finally, in, in most people, eventual dementia. Here's uh, just to jump right into some of the prodromal symptoms and the evidence for those prodromal symptoms. Here's a meta-analysis for anxiety 
conditions and depressive disorders as a risk factor for Parkinson's disease. Now, look, sometimes the anxiety and depression that's experienced before an individual develops Parkinson's is just going to be the normal population idiopathic anxiety and depressive disorders that any of us could get, right? Because obviously not everyone who has an anxiety disorder or a depressive disorder early in life goes on to develop Parkinson's. But when they do, we're very suspicious that that represents maybe an earlier stage of that BRAC staging process that, that I just showed you, okay? And here's the evidence from a meta-analysis that included 13 studies, and many of them were very large, uh, either case control studies or cohort studies. And, and what you can see is that the combined odds ratio across these studies was that people who have anxiety or depressive disorders earlier in life are at almost a twofold risk of later Parkinson's. And then you can ask, is this truly a risk, a separate variable that conveys an increased risk of a different condition? Or is it just early undiagnosed Parkinson's disease? And that's really the question because that's gonna be very important when we enter the era of disease modifying therapies because the earlier we recognize it, the earlier we can initiate treatment and either slow or prevent progression. So. Here's what it would look like. So let me orient you to this figure because it's basically just a recapitulation of what I just showed you uh, from the epidemiologic data. If you look at the x-axis, that horizontal line at the bottom, time zero is the time when the motor symptoms of Parkinson's are recognized in an individual, okay? That's stage three in the BRAC model, that's time zero. So everything to the left of that in red, the red bars, is potentially a prodromal manifestation of the disease as an anxiety or depressive disorder. And everything to the right of that are anxiety or depressive disorders that happen once the motor symptoms are recognized, okay? So the first thing to appreciate is that anxiety and depression can happen at any stage of the disease if you believe that the disease is active, you know, a decade or more before, right? And it certainly seems to peak when the disease and motor symptoms are recognized, okay? Now, here is a, a polysomnography tracing of an individual who has REM sleep behavior disorder. So REM sleep behavior disorder is someone who during REM sleep, dream sleep, can no longer remain paralyzed. They act out their dreams, often thrashing, kicking, screaming, yelling. Oftentimes bedmates are injured during this time. And so you can see in the top tracing, this is someone who has normal REM sleep with the high amplitude waves uh, sort of uh, paralleled by no movement in the chin and upper and lower limb leads. You can see that they have atonia, they're paralyzed during the REM sleep. And then in segment B on the bottom of the slide, you can see the high amplitude waves and the, LF, uh, and the uh, EEG are basically indicating that someone is in the REM phase of sleep, but they're not paralyzed. You can see that the chin lead, the upper and lower uh, joint, you know, limb leads are moving because the person is thrashing around, acting out their dream. Now, the reason this is important is because this is now a biomarker of people who are unquestionably at higher risk for Parkinson's later in life. This right now is probably one of our most sensitive and specific markers of people who go on to develop an alpha synucleinopathy like Parkinson's disease or dementia with Lewy bodies or multiple system atrophy 10 to 20 years after having this REM sleep behavior disorder, okay? Now, uh, one more time, I just wanna sort of map this out one more time to show you what it would look like when this sort of uh, projection, this sort of pre-motor, motor, and you know, cortex-involving disease plays out across an individual's life. So again, to orient you to the figure, the horizontal line, the x-axis, time zero, is the time of motor symptom onset. The reason it's been placed squarely in the middle of this is because if you endorse the BRAC staging, that's at stage three in a six point scale right in the middle, okay? Everything to the left is before you're even diagnosed in the classic model of Parkinson's disease. You're having maybe constipation, which represents that early dysautonomia. You're having the RBD, which is the REM 
sleep behavior disorder. Sometimes you're having depression or anxiety before the onset of the disease, which might be associated with that increased risk or be an early non-motor sign of the disease. At time zero, your neurologist or your doctor recognizes the slowed movement, maybe a little bit of tremor, whatever your symptoms are. And then as the disease progresses, you see you start to accumulate additional elements, both motor and non-motor. You can see you're getting things like freezing of gait, fluctuations, dyskinesia, which are the motor complications of treatment with the dopaminergic agents. You're also getting uh, accumulation of things like uh, the dysautonomia. Now it's affecting your urinary symptom. You're getting orthostatic hypotension. It's affecting your cognition. Some people are developing dementia and all playing out as you go from BRAC stage one, two, three, four, five, six, the Lewy bodies are marching toward your cortex. So briefly, I want to talk individually about the symptoms I mentioned. So, you know, I talked about the REM sleep behavior disorder, a little bit about anxiety and depression together, but let me show you what these might look like in an individual who's suffering from Parkinson's. So anxiety is a big issue in Parkinson's. It's going to affect at least uh, half of people in terms of just having symptoms that are bothersome anxiety symptoms that are bothersome, but up to a third of people with Parkinson's are actually going to have a, a formal anxiety disorder. And many times these look just like the anxiety disorders you would see in anyone, the same anxiety disorders that would be in the diagnostic and statistical manual of psychiatry, things like generalized anxiety disorder, panic disorder. But sometimes they're going to have a presentation that's more specific to Parkinson's disease. And let me show you what that would look like. So again, same theme here, time zero is when the movement symptoms start, but also around that time in that orange peak is when we start introducing dopamine medications. And remember, I told you that dopamine medications, you take them orally, they relieve your movement symptoms, but then eventually they wear off and the movement symptoms start to return. What we found is the anxiety for the most part, two thirds of the anxiety of that orange peak around the time of Parkinson's when medications are being introduced is actually a, Parkin is a Parkinson's type anxiety that we don't find in the general population related to the fluctuations in their dopamine medications for the movement symptoms, okay? And this is not found in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. This is not a type of anxiety that you'd necessarily find in the general population. So here's what dopamine administration on off fluctuation looks like. You can see their PD medication with the first arrow there. The patient takes it by mouth. Their bradykinesia gets better. They're moving faster. They're making bigger movements. Their tremor is usually reduced. Their rigidity is improved. They peak. That's considered the on time. But then eventually the medication wears off. Now, ideally, they'll be taking another medication before they experience that trough. But even with best efforts, people have some fluctuation in their medication over the course of the disease, right? It's hard to keep up. During these times, people experience both a return of motor symptoms, but also psychiatric symptoms like anxiety during that trough. And then some people feel dysphoric or depressed during that low dopamine trough in the medication dosing interval. And this was demonstrated very persuasively by a group out in the Oregon Health System here in the States, uh, Jay, uh, Miracle and Jay Nuts Group uh, did this work. And they, they started a dopamine infusion and they had people tap their fingers to measure their motor function, but at the same time, they rated their mood. And what they found is that as they started the dopamine infusion, not only did people's movement improve, which was no surprise, right? For years, we've been, since the 1960s, we've been improving movement with levodopa infusion. But what was very concretely established was that mood for many individuals was also entrained to the dopamine level. So their mood also got better. And when they stopped the infusion, the movement got smaller and slower and the mood got worse, became more depressed. In the same way, they demonstrated this with anxiety. Uh, the anxiety as the infusion started was relieved, was reduced. You can see it go down there in the gray box during the course of the dopamine, uh, the levodopa infusion. When the dopamine infusion was stopped, the anxiety went back up. People became much more anxious. And so again, this also, for some people, established a link between dopamine levels, 
and anxiety. And so when we look at how you might treat, and this is a very busy slide, but I just want to show it to you. And, and so you have it for reference. This is the way we approach the treatment of anxiety and Parkinson's. We start with uh, an assessment of whether or not there's a special condition associated with the anxiety. So is, are these people having on off fluctuations with their Parkinson's, in which case they need to first start to work with their neurologist to alleviate these fluctuations, because that might be one of the biggest things to help the anxiety, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, all of the things, the antidepressant medications that we use to treat anxiety for regular anxiety conditions might be a little helpful, but I think there really needs to be an appreciation for the elements that might be specific to the Parkinson's. And so what this tells us is that the neurologist and psychiatrist, the team has to work together to address the whole individual and the entire motor and non-motor uh, symptom profile in order to get the best outcome. And that's really what this slide is about. I mentioned some specific class of agents here, but really the point of the slide is to appreciate that you need to account for the contribution of Parkinson's on the anxiety. So, so many individuals who fall become avoidant of going out of the house or doing things because they're afraid of falling. So you have to address behaviorally that fear of falling in order to treat the the, the anxiety. And so again, uh, not to go over every single point, but I think that's the, that's the thrust of this slide. Now, the, the other symptom that I think is uh, really important here and, uh, you know, has been talked about, fortunately, for a couple of decades is depression and Parkinson's disease. And I really want to make an argument here. I'm going to tell you about its impact. But the argument I really want to make is, remember, just like uh, the motor symptoms, and I can show you a picture of the midbrain and the depletion of the dopamine containing cells. Depression for many people is really associated with the disease process and affects how people function. So right now, one of the largest ongoing studies, maybe the largest of Parkinson's is the Parkinson's Outcome Project uh, sponsored by the Parkinson Foundation. It's a longitudinal look at which treatments produce the best health outcomes in Parkinson's. There's you know, over 10,000 people involved in the study right now. And basically one of the findings was that the impact of depression on quality of life and Parkinson's was almost twice that of the motor symptoms. So here's a symptom that isn't central to the diagnosis, but has an outsized effect on the quality of life, the day-to-day -day quality of life of individuals suffering from the disease. And it's very common. So at least half of people with Parkinson's will have some depressive symptoms with a quarter, 25% suffering a major depressive episode at some point over the disease course, right? And you're often going to see anxiety and depression co-occur. Now, here's what's really interesting is there aren't walls between these symptoms. Having one symptom influences the trajectory of other symptoms. And what you can see here is that in studies that followed people from either you know, disease recognition up until they started medication to treat the motor symptoms found that being depressed increased the need to start symptomatic therapy for your movement symptoms. So just the depression alone, a non-movement symptom modified how soon you would need dopamine treatment. And controlling for the severity of motor symptoms on that UPRS scale that I showed you, that unified Parkinson's disease rating scale, even when two individuals had the same severity of motor symptoms, being depressed alone increased the level of disability in activities of daily living, ADLs, okay, simple things like walking, bathing, grooming, hygiene. Now we were really, my group was really impressed by this finding. And so we went a, a step further and we actually looked at the longitudinal impact of depression, specifically on physical disability. And I'm just going to show you a quick figure that I think summarizes the finding. So let me orient you to this. We use something called the Northwestern Disability uh, Scale, okay? And that's on the y-axis, that vertical line, with higher scores, you know, toward 50, being more functional, less disabled. And these are things like walking, eating, bathing, dressing, feeding yourself, okay? Very simple activities of daily living. And then 
the, the horizontal line there, the x-axis, the visit number is years. Each visit, we visited people every two years. So this represents about six years of patient lives here. And what we found, and hopefully you can see, is that that green solid line is people who are never depressed, okay? And what you can see is Parkinson's disease is progressive. So very slowly over time, even the best treated people decline a little bit in their abilities to do day-to-day -day things like eating, bathing, walking, speaking, right? But when they're depressed, they function at a much lower level in these physical things. So just for the fact of being depressed, controlling for everything else, these people are less functional physically. Now, they also seem to decline maybe a little bit faster. Now, what's a, a good message, I think, is that you can see that red dash line are people who are actively depressed. If, if that depression remits either spontaneously or if we treat the depression into remission, they function better at any point in time that we relieve the depression physically. So that means that treating depression can have a functional impact on your day-to-day -day activities. And then again, I won't go into every detail, but this is just an algorithm and this is published, uh, you, you know, the article you can reference there. Uh, right now, there have been some pretty good studies on antidepressant treatment and Parkinson's giving pretty good evidence on the best agents to use. And so things like uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors or selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors are helpful and should be started when you recognize any significant depressive symptoms in people with Parkinson's disease. And then we sort of suggest an algorithm depending on how people respond. And again, I think it's also important to recognize the contribution of Parkinson's and other symptoms. For instance, if someone's having visual hallucinations due to the Parkinson's and they're depressed, if you're augmenting their antidepressant treatment, you might choose an antipsychotic like Seroquel to augment your antidepressant therapy because it'll help with two of the symptoms. And so this is just a, a slide to remind you to be mindful of the total disease presentation while addressing any of these neuropsychiatric uh, symptoms. Now, I wanna talk just briefly about psychosis in Parkinson's disease because this is gonna affect anywhere from a third to 60% of people over the course of the disease being much more likely in advanced disease, okay? And there's certainly a contribution between the disease itself and what it's doing to the brain, but also the exposure to exogenous dopamine and dopamine precursors like levodopa to treat the motor symptoms. Those two things are probably the chief contributors to the symptom of psychosis and Parkinson's. And the way it's diagnosed, there's formal criteria now that, are, that have been sort of outlined by the National Institute of Neurological Disease and Stroke and the National Institute of Mental Health here in the States. And these include at least one of the following symptoms, illusions or a false sense of presence, hallucinations and delusions. Now, all of you are probably familiar with hallucinations and delusions. So hallucinations, are a false perception in the absence of an external stimulus and delusions are false thoughts, you know, false fixed idiosyncratic beliefs, right? But the, the things that I think were included in this criteria that were really important in the case of Parkinson's are many people experience illusions, which are a distortion of a stimulus of the environment, of a perceived stimulus in the environment. So something has to be present, but then its representation has been distorted and then a false sense of presence is also what we call a minor phenomenon in Parkinson's. And so this inclusion of these minor phenomena, uh, and here I have them outlined, illusions, passage hallucinations, and sense of presence are really what we think have made this presentation of psychosis more specific to the Parkinson's patient. Now, passage hallucinations are seeing something indistinct move in the periphery of your visual field. And you look and you see that nothing's there. Now, sense of presence is, for instance, let's say you're washing your hands at the sink and you feel as if someone's entered the room and is standing behind you. You have the distinct sense that they're there, but you don't perceive anything. You just have a feeling. You turn and look and no one's there. That actually happens 
fairly commonly in Parkinson's. And so I wanna show you some data that shows you the relative prevalence of each of these symptoms. So you can see visual hallucinations, auditory hallucinations, tactile hallucinations, maybe the sense that things are crawling on you or there's sand in, embedded in your skin, people tell me. Uh, somatic, olfactory, gustatory hallucinations. So the whole range of hallucinations are represented. And the point of this slide is to show you that when you use the usual definition, the non-Parkinson's specific definition of psychosis, the diagnosis rate was about, you know, 43%, whereas uh, that the prevalence, diagnosed prevalence was about 43%. Using this more Parkinson's specific criteria, the the prevalence was 60, which is what we think reflects the, the more valid or truer uh, estimate of the prevalence of psychosis. So again, we do think that there's a, a Parkinson's specific presentation of psychosis in many individuals. And then uh, again, I think if you look, uh, and I'll just show you one more slide about this, uh, about the contribution of dopamine medications to the psychosis, you can see that there's pretty good evidence that being exposed to dopamine is important and that it at least increases the risk, if not uh, being causal. And so you can see the odds are greatly increased per 100 milligram equivalent of levodopa, whether you're using levodopa itself or a dopamine agonist, we can sort of uh, consolidate that into a metric we call levodopa equivalence. And that increases your risk of experiencing the psychosis, but another main driver is just how long and how severe your Parkinson's disease is. So the duration of your Parkinson's and how severe, you know, where the Lewy bodies are in the brain, we think as they approach the cortex and get into that fourth, fifth, and sixth BRAC stage, that that increases the risk. And then just, uh, you know, in terms of treatment, you have to be really careful not to use any medications that blockade the dopamine receptors, okay? Most of the antipsychotics like Haldol that we use today uh, and Risperdal, uh, Olanzapine, uh, blockade type two uh, dopamine receptors, which is gonna make the Parkinson's worse and can actually be very dangerous. And so you have to use antipsychotics that don't blockade the type two receptor. And here's a list of the antipsychotics that we feel are the best to use in Parkinson's and anything outside of this risks worsening the movement portion of the disease. Uh, so this is a table you can reference. This is the best current evidence. And then just really quickly, and I don't wanna to spend too much time on this, but I think it's important because I think it's been underappreciated. I want to talk about how this disease that is first recognized as a motor symptom, although it may have been active for 10 or more years before the motor symptoms is also for many people a dementing illness, okay? And so the Lewy body dementias, which include Parkinson's disease, which after usually many years, you know, maybe 10 years on average, develops dementia or dementia with Lewy bodies that has dementia right away, very early in the disease, certainly within the first year or so of the disease, are associated with Lewy bodies being in the brainstem and usually the cortex, causing cognitive decline, progressive cognitive decline and disability related specifically to the cognitive symptoms, not just the motor disability. These two entities, Parkinson's disease that later develops dementia and dementia with Lewy bodies, have been recognized at least since the 1960s in association with Lewy bodies and misfolded alpha synuclein are probably the second most common neurodegenerative dementia. So, you know, you have Alzheimer's as the most common neurodegenerative dementia. Then you have vascular dementia, right? Which is not necessarily neurodegenerative. And then you have uh, Parkinson's disease and Lewy body. So if you take out the vascular and just talk about neurodegenerative, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's are the one and two. And this probably accounts for 20% of dementias, right? But we don't necessarily talk about it as a major player in the diseases that cause dementia. And because we're talking about Parkinson's today, uh, I want to focus mostly on the Parkinson's dementia. And so really the way this is diagnosed is you have to have a diagnosis of Parkinson's, uh, motor symptoms have to develop prior to 
the onset of the dementia. Okay. Now this is tricky because sometimes people will progress within just three or four or five years to dementia. Usually this is age dependent because age plays a role. The older you are, the faster the dementia onset in people with Parkinson's disease typically. But if you develop it before the movement symptoms are recognized or very uh, quickly within the same time frame or within a year, we usually consider that dementia with Lewy bodies. So that timing of onset relative to motor symptom onset is an important thing. And then this cognitive change has to be associated with a, a global change in your cognitive efficiency and your ability to function on a day-to-day -day level, okay? Now, here's another chart for reference. One of the, there's many things that we now know that differentiate Parkinson's disease from dementia with Lewy bodies, but the ones that are most clinically obvious are, is that timing, that difference in timing. Uh, usually dementia with Lewy bodies, DLB, will have a faster course. Usually hallucinations will be more prominent early in dementia with Lewy bodies. Uh, whereas with Parkinson's, uh, usually you're going to have 10 or more years of just motor symptoms uh, before you start to have significant cognitive impairment. Uh, the reason that this is important is because this really talks uh, to the uh, prognosis of the individual. So sort of giving them this label is important for them to be able to plan in terms of what they can expect year over year, but it's really more dimensional than categorical. And if you were to show these brains, a person with dementia with Lewy bodies or Parkinson's disease <laughs> dementia at the current time to a pathologist, the Lewy body distribution would be very similar. And so the point is the history is key into which uh, entity the individual has. Now, the uh, prevalence of dementia and Parkinson's disease is that if you looked cross-sectionally at any individual with Parkinson's randomly, if you just dropped into their house, about 30% of individuals living with Parkinson's in the world would have a dementia, okay? But if you take into account how long they've had it, as I mentioned, the cumulative prevalence is what's significant. And the rule of thumb that I use, there's data here on the screen, but the rule of thumb that I use is that half, 50%, will have dementia within 10 years of motor symptom onset. And about 80% of individuals will have dementia within 20 years of motor symptom onset. Now, in terms of the treatments, uh, there are efficacious treatments. They don't do a whole lot. It's very much like Alzheimer's disease, although there are things that are approved for use. They're very modest in terms of their benefit. I've listed them here. These are the names we use in the States. I, I assume very uh, comparable uh, medications are used uh, in Europe and, and in your location. Um, uh, these are, let me tell you, Every time I prescribe these, I wish we could do more for the patients I give these to. They help a little bit. They might slow the uh, symptom progression, but they don't necessarily alter the out outcome, which is dementia and disability. And then I think I'll stop here because I've covered what I think is, is the range of symptoms of Parkinson's disease from not just the movement symptoms when it's diagnosed, but from things we suspect and now know occur in many people before the disease is clinically recognized, but the pathology is present in the brain. So I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Ponton, for this very exhaustive presentation. You've actually changed some of the things that I thought I knew about Parkinson's disease, uh, and, and I hope the rest of the audience thinks the same too. Uh, but before I, I Put my question. Maybe let me open up to um, the audience. Anybody with a question, please uh, put up your hand and or unmute and ask. Uh, we'll take a set of questions and hand back to Professor Ponton to respond, and then maybe do like two rounds. So anybody, um, anybody with a question? Anybody with a question? Mine is not a question, Ian, Thank but you. probably to, to make a comment that uh, of the importance of, of collaboration between uh, the different specialists. And, and I'm not sure 
how much that is right here. You talked about the neurologists and the psychiatrists. Uh, and this is something that I take out of here, the collaboration, but also in a country where 80% or more uh, don't have an access to even a specialist. Uh, I think we should rethink uh, how we are going to offer services to, to people who need them, people who might have movement disorders, but also uh, dementia. And what I think about is probably to empower the, the medical officers, as we call them, who see most of the people to, to identify and then refer where they can. Uh, but also this is an area maybe which we need to improve on in our curricula so that Parkinson's is more than uh, the movement disorder or when we are training that, that we, we have, uh, we learned or probably that is still going on at the moment. Thank you. You know, you know Sarah, I, I think what you just said is also become a, a hot topic here in the States. So as much as we like to um, envision this ideal model where there's all these specialists who are collaborating on one individual's care, it turns out that for the majority of people here in the States, they also do not have access necessarily to you know, movement disorder specialists or specialty care. And it turns out that a substantial portion of people who have Parkinson's, even when it's recognized, are being treated by their their internist or their medical doctor with no neurologist, not let alone a specialist neurologist, and they're responsible for providing all the care, whether it's for the psychiatric symptoms or the movement symptoms or all of this. And so I think more and more the, the conversation is steering to just as you said, how do we train individuals, regardless of what their specialty will be, who will encounter these people with Parkinson's to ma just make sure they're aware of the full range of symptoms and that they do their best to address each one. Okay, thank you very much. Um, any questions from anyone else? Um... If not, then I can, I can, I can, oh, there's a question from, from Kenneth in the chat. Um, you can also do that. You can post your question in the chat. Uh, some of us might have difficulty with the uh, internet connectivity. And I can see Kenneth has posted his, the criteria had radicinesia with either tremor or muscle rigidity. So I think, uh, uh, you can pick up from there. Uh, yeah, this, this is a, yeah. So I see this, this is a great question. This is, um, you know, this is the question right now that I think has become one of the most important in, in the field of Parkinson's disease research. And so the question that I think has been very eloquently posed here is how, so now that we recognize the existence of this uh, prodromal stage of Parkinson's disease, how do we recognize it, right? So, you know, these people, I mean, why would you go to your doctor if, uh, why would you go to a neurologist if you're not moving funny, right? If you don't have bradykinesia, if you don't have a tremor, why are you presenting to the doctor in the first place? You know, I, I have many things that are probably symptoms of something and I never go to my doctor. So why would anyone else? So how are we going to know that these individuals have this prodromal early presentation? That is the, you know, million dollar question. And so some of the things are that when, let's say, for instance, that people present with something like REM sleep behavior disorder, they're, you know, maybe they've hit their bed partner. So this is often, I can tell you, this is a true story that we've heard. People will start acting out their dreams, thrashing around, and not just a little bit, right? Not just occasionally talking in their sleep. They'll be thrashing around, they'll hit their bed partner, and it's happening over and over again. They present to the sleep specialist or someone who does a polysomnography, and they have confirmed uh, REM sleep behavior disorder. Now, with what we know, those people in sleep centers where, you know, the movement disorder society is reaching out to sleep centers saying, hey, if you have individuals with this polysomnography confirmed REM sleep behavior disorder, you need to bring them to clinical attention. And now we have things like that scan, which is a dopamine transporter SPECT scan that can actually look at the dopamine transporter function in the brain. And even early on, before people develop motor symptoms, it can detect 
deficiencies in that dopamine transporter system. And so at least with some of these symptoms, the more conspicuous prodromal symptoms, we can pick these individuals out who are either at higher risk or almost certainly going to progress to Parkinson's. And we're starting to uh, sort of cluster symptoms. So what if you have REM sleep behavior disorder, you also test that you've lost your sense of smell and oh, by the way, you've suffered from an anxiety disorder, your odds of getting Parkinson's, you know, are 90% or more within the next 10 years. Uh, thank you. I, I, I think I dropped off and I came back on, um, but it's good to see it's still going on. Uh, yeah. One question was was uh, around. I can ask my question since no one else wants to ask theirs. Was on um, like you mentioned before the time slide 16, 17, 18. Uh, um, when you have those, uh, you talked about the thrashing uh, and acting out dreams. It's it's good you actually said what extent is severe, uh, because uh, I know there are many people who have probably seen children acting out their dreams and they'll probably get worried about them being potential candidates for Parkinson's in that alley. Um, but uh, looking at that, the, these non-motor symptoms as a whole, uh, I know also from my own learning experience, an anatomist, uh, memory and learning disorders, I think falls also among that. Uh, and, and that's something that you probably want to, to, to mention and talk about uh, as part of this presentation. Um, but from an anatomical perspective, you talked about uh, the 60-70% cell death or clearing of the dopamine cells to, to, to have this symptom. Now, this, these, these uh, non-motor symptoms, how badly off are we doing? Are we at 30%? Are we at 20%? Uh, should be pretty worse. So there are really two questions in one. The, the, yeah. the extent of damage up in the brain, and then also the, the, the sleep, that example of sleep, acting out sleep, um, what should be alarming enough? Uh, how, how far back should we go? Should children who act out their dreams be candidates for Parkinsonism? Should we worry about more common things like cerebral pulse that we have down here um, that can also affect, can, should we worry yeah. about that? No, I, I think one? those are, you know, great, great questions. And so, you know, because the, the midbrain and the substantia nigra in particular have received so much attention, you know, over the last 100 years because of the focus on the motor symptoms, we're, you know, we can fairly quantitatively, you know, determine how much uh, of the cell loss in the substantia nigra, you know, predicts the onset of these motor symptoms and the severity of these motor symptoms. But for all of the other symptoms, although we suspect that the presence of Lewy bodies, alpha synuclein and cell loss in certain areas is associated, we have no, no quantitative sort of um, measurement of how correlated these will be. In fact, in many cases, we're not even certain of the regions. And so I think right now there's a lot of research uh, looking at how these other BRAC stages might be uh, more directly correlated with each of these symptoms. And just as you said, you know, right now we're relying on uh, other symptoms for the prodromal presentation. We have biomarkers like polysomnography uh, that measure this. Another important one to, to your point is, and this is outside of the brain, is uh, what we call meta iodal benzyl guanidine scintigraphy. So I mentioned just very briefly that um, there is sympathetic denervation of the heart early on in people with Parkinson's disease. And this can actually be detected on, on that special uh, meta iodal benzyl guanidine test of the heart, the sympathetic nervous system there. And that's something that, again, that you wouldn't necessarily go to the doctor complaining of, and you necessarily wouldn't necessarily have that specialized test. But what I can tell you is that that has nearly the same sensitivity and specificity for later Parkinson's and later Lewy body disease, as does the REM sleep behavior disorder. And yet clinically, it's most often silent in individuals. So you know, a lot of these markers, and I, I think these are kind of two great questions back to back, are not something that the individual is going to come to clinical attention for. And because it's a one, you know, remember Parkinson's disease, although I get really excited about it, is still just a 1% prevalence disease. And so not many people care as much as I do, 
so we're not going to start a whole public health screening campaign to look for REM sleep behavior disorder or to do this fancy uh, scan of the cardiac uh, sympathetic innervation. And so although we're recognizing that there are ways to detect this disease early, I think your point is absolutely true. And no health system, whether it's here in the States or there in Africa or in Europe, nobody's going to necessarily institute these. So I, I think your point is saying, well, boy, how do we move to a more mainstream uh, symptom profile to detect these people early? And that is exactly you know, what a lot of research is being done about. Thank you very much. I think you got my question spot on uh, how we move to detecting this earlier. And, and maybe should we worry about some things we are seeing? And your answer is probably not. Uh, maybe explore much more. Um, and and that, that's, that's educative for us as health professionals. Um, I'd like to invite other people. Anybody else with a question? I'll take one or two more questions and uh, I'll call it a day. And it's 5 p.m. here. And many of us are probably thinking about running home or picking children. So that's why I'm saying we have one or two more questions from anybody. You can unmute it, your mic. Yeah, and can I say one thing? And maybe to apologize to our presenter today. It seems we had a challenge with our links. And that's why uh, uh, many people are not able to, to connect. Would be grateful if you can send the slides so that we can share them. Uh, the link on the po poster had some, some, some issues. Uh, and we are very sorry about, about this. Otherwise, it has been a very interesting uh, presentation about something that we see in the community. Uh, we see cases of people shaking and rigidity. Uh, this has been very, very useful. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Chiguli. Uh, there's a question Hello. in the chat. Dr. Minari, yes. Dr. Ayan. Yes, Hello. Ben. Ben, go ahead. Yes, uh, I'm very fun. My network is not very supportive. Hope I really make it. I'm glad uh, to say thank you, Professor. Glad to meet my teacher, Sarah Chiguri, and uh, my OB Ian. Now, uh, looks like Parkinson's is a, a sure case, just rather like death, as long as you live long enough. May I just know whether there's a way in our lifestyle, in other issues, the way we can probably not get it. Because I'm almost now sure I'm, I'm going to get buckets. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I, I think that's also another area that we're very interested in. So prevention and living well with the disease is very important. And so it is, a, for most people, fortunately, it is a chronic disease. And if you have good symptomatic treatment, most people can sustain for a long time a fairly good quality of life. And we do think that the way you live matters. So we want people to remain active and social and connected to family uh, while they have the disease. In terms of prevention, we're not exactly sure in most cases what causes it. And so right now, it's the minor minority of cases that we know have a clear genetic link, the minority. So that unfortunately, and this is scary, means that for many, many people with Parkinson's, there was some sort of environmental exposure to a toxin or something else that triggered the disease onset. Okay, maybe they had a genetic predisposition in some cases, maybe they just reached a threshold of exposure. And right now, probably the big items are herbicides and pesticide exposure, uh, especially when it leaches into the groundwater. Here in the States, we have a, a big problem because in many communities, our municipal water supply is aging and there's a lot of uh, contamination. And especially in um, communities where we have a lot of agriculture, the chemicals get in and it's in our drinking water. And I think we're seeing a, a higher prevalence because of that contamination in our water supply here in the States. And I think other places may have similar, similar issues. Um, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Uh, what Ben didn't say is with the, he's, a, he's part of the military service. So probably I think the issue of um, traumatic brain injury, uh, similar to what you have in sports, 
punch, punch, uh, fucking punch drunkenness. So Pakistan is a bit of concern to him. Uh, but for the military, I think the the shock from using uh, high velocity firearms um, and looking that back to the brain, maybe that's where Ben is coming from. He can clarify. Uh, but you speak about that. But there's also a question in the chat, uh, probably similar to I'll detect it again from Dr. Fatuma. No, it's okay. Uh, Maybe you can speak to both of those. And, yeah, um, yeah both people. of those are great questions. So I'll speak to Ben's question first um, about the environment and the, so head trauma. So traumatic brain injury or head trauma is absolutely linked to an increased risk of Parkinson's. And so military service, at, at least here in the States, both the head trauma, but unfortunately, as you're probably aware from the news, our military uses a lot of the defoliants, you know, the herbicides <laughs> to clear land before they have a military deployment. And so right now in the States, um, a big class action lawsuit was about a defoliant we used in Vietnam and other wars uh, to clear forests and jungles. And so uh, many of our troops were also exposed to this. And now it's 100% service connected for Parkinson's disease. And we see probably an increased rate of Parkinson's in our military uh, veterans because of the use of this compound. The head injury issue is a little more complicated because that seems to put you at risk of not just Parkinson's, but many other uh, movement disorders, but also including Parkinson's. And then the other question in the chat, which is, this is one of my favorite topics, is what's the importance of early detection? And I, to me, this is the holy grail, right? Because I think within our lifetimes, we will have a disease modifying treatment for Parkinson's, something that either slows or stops disease progression. And so the earlier you can recognize this before the neurons are lost, before the brain is damaged, before the alpha synuclein is widely spread, the, the more uh, quality of life you can grant the individual, right? So if you stop it before the tremor gets bad, or you stop it maybe in the prodromal stage before they even have movement symptoms, then they never develop what we've classically considered Parkinson's disease. So I really think early detection, once we develop disease modifying treatments is the maybe the most important strategy. Okay, so, um... I'll beg to end here for today. Um, I request Professor Ponton, please share the slides um, so that we can share it with everybody who was here. Um, once again, I'd like to thank you very much for this presentation. It, it's, it's actually a knife opener. Most of us, even me before this presentation, I thought of Parkinsonism as purely movement. Uh, but now I see that it's, it's, it's really more than movement. And whereas that's... Um, educative to me, it's, it's, it's also scary because uh, there, there are many people who are now trying to say, could that person have been on the way to developing Parkinsonism? Could that patient have been on the way to developing Parkinsonism? Um, I really like Ben's question. Um, ben, you forgive me for giving the additional history about yourself. Um, but again, there, there, there are environmental issues you've got to think about now. And could this be a much bigger problem than what we're dealing with right now? And most of us, our population gets older. Um, we've got to think about um, injury to the brain early in life and during life and how it manifests later on as we get older. So, so what you've talked about may be of much more relevance down here. And again, for the audience, uh, just so you're aware that um, they said that by 2050, Alzheimer's will be a problem for us in the LMICs, bigger problem than it is for people in the States where Ponton is. So could some of these Alzheimer's that we may see then be actually Parkinsonism hidden? Um, so these are the questions running through my mind right now after your presentation. And I'd like to thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And um, my hope is that when you get your slides, we shall share these and probably Sit how to arrange to have probably another session with you at a later date and dive into this in a little bit more detail um, with whoever will be interested. But I thank everybody for coming. Uh, we've had people from all over the country. Ponton, just so that you know, uh, like I mentioned, Ben, my classmate is from the armed forces. We've had people from the city authority, Daphne, 
and then various people from the different universities around the country and a couple of colleagues from really far up country. So the, the, the audience is pretty diverse from different disciplines, different areas, different sectors. And they're all showing, even though we are only 15 right now, it's still a diversity, which I think if our link had worked as we expected, we'd have had many more. So don't, don't be disappointed by the small number. It's, it's, it's a technical glitch on our part, but there have been many more than this today. So I thank you very much. Um, I don't know if you have any parting remarks. Uh, no, thank uh, you for having me. It's always my pleasure. I I'll always like uh, to distribute what I know about this topic. So thank you very much. And I thank everybody for being on. Um, it's it's 5.20. Many of us are picking children right now. So I'll allow us to run off and pick our children. Um, I wish you all a, I wish you all a, I wish you all a very nice day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Thank you.